Thanks for joining me in this episode of Arrivals. We are currently on the boat in Hong Kong. More importantly, we're on the junk boat, uh, ferrying ourselves between uh, the Kowloon Peninsula uh, to the island of Hong Kong. Uh, in this trip, we shall explore some of the treasures that Hong Kong has to offer, including an interview uh, with a student of Ipman himself. I'll be speaking with Master Lau of the Wing Chun Association and ask him about what is it that attracts Wing Chun uh, learners from all around the world into his gym and learning more about Wing Chun. These are just some of the things that we can look at while we're here in Hong Kong. Stay with me throughout this journey for this episode of Arrivals. visit to Hong Kong, it's extremely hard to stray away from the cliches of the Chinese culture. But because of the irresistible opportunity that presents itself in my visit this time around, I just had to grab it. I am visiting a Wing Chun master and the first generation disciple of Ip Man himself. I speak with Sam Lau, who is a master of Wing Chun Kung Fu. He is the first generation disciple of Ip Man and an assistant of the Ip Man Wing Chun Kung Fu Association here in Hong Kong. Ah, I'm Sifu Lao, Sam Lao. Yeah, I, I'm been a student assigned by Ip Man as his disciple uh, and also his assistant instructor. I've been doing Wing Chun for over 52 years and I taught Wing Chun uh, over 50 years. I think I have more than 20,000 students. Because I, I do it since 1968. Yeah, when Yiman came, you know, I mean, uh, people can go to his gym and learn from him. Not difficult, just pay him money, you know, because he have to make his living. And after a while, after uh, like uh, 30 years, something like that, you know, uh, Yiman become very famous, and uh, still have many people look for him. That uh, he have he have to choose the students. See see if they really work hard or really want to learn uh, so you meant to uh, accept them you know uh, me I'm a special one you know because uh, I supposed to learn from him before but he's he have no gym that time so he said oh wait you know I have no gym you he sent me to a student to learn for a little while first and then one day he meant call me up and talk to me sing Jai uh, come and call me Sifu, buy Si, something like that. Tell me to uh, call him a Sifu, so he accept me, or assign me as his student, you know. And also uh, tell me to assist him uh, when I train with them that time, you know. So I'm a very special one. I'm happy that Yi Man uh, found out that uh, and appreciate, uh, you know, Yi Man want me to be a student. That's, that's my honor, you know. Wing Chun is a concept based traditional Southern Chinese Kung Fu that carries on a Wushu style that requires quick arm movements and strong leg to defeat its opponents. It has since been popularized by Hong Kong and Hollywood stars that include people like Ip Man, Bruce Lee, Brandon Lee, Jackie Chan, Donnie Yen, Robert Downey Jr., Jason Statham and more. This is the conversation that we need to have into what makes Wing Chun a most artistic form of self defense and one that captivates many many fans around the world honestly I did uh, Western boxing I have uh, experience in Thai boxing and but I spend most of my time in Wing Chun because Wing Chun is a very good technique you know very very I think I like it most it's the best technique in fighting it's a very good technique in defense the defense means fighting uh, especially for the women, I think they have no choice, you know. If they really want to fight, that's Wing Chun. Wing Chun is the best because uh, our founder is a female and uh, in order to kill, in order to 
fit up the man, they have used the, uh, uh, they have some technique. Whereas Speedy and Fierce and like that, then you can win. And, and uh, hit the 30 pay card, 30 pay, uh, 30 K part like yeah. gold, chin, eye. Yeah. Otherwise, how can you build up the uh, man with muscle, you know? So it's good for, for, for us, a small size, to learn it, you know? Yeah. After an interesting session with Master Lau, we then went to the tea house called the Linong Tea House to actually experience some traditional tea ceremony up here in the gorgeous mountain of the Lantau Islands. Hello everyone, welcome to Lino Tea House. We have the blooming tea for our demonstration today. You can see this little ball is so tiny and delicate when we open it. And this is also hiding uh, many secrets inside. And we can prepare and seeing the blooming magical moments. People call this is a magic tea, and this is will blooming completely in a minute. This blooming tea have uh, more than ten types of combination until we invented now. And this one of type is a major help with lung. And you can see uh, the even the sample is different as what we have this one. It's uh, some for the medical usage. It's uh, this jasmine for strengthened immune system. And the osmanthus type, these flowers, is for kidney and uh, liver. So different flowers showing the presentation different, healthy benefit also different. And holding this really tiny teacup to most of uh, Western guests, and they will easy to burn the finger because the tea, hot tea. So we will use the mother finger and the third finger and just hold the edge of the teacup and do it and other hand the two fingers to hold the bottom and then drink it directly. Meanwhile, you can also smell the tea flavor and then this is the most traditional way and most of what we uh, would learn to how to enjoy the blooming tea. We'll go for a short break. When we come back, we'll take a look into how Hong Kong preserves its heritage as well as its beautiful buildings for generations to come. Hong Kong takes pride in preserving their heritage, 
but they are also happy to introduce new culture, new art as well into the public domain. Take for instance the Old Town Central's street art. Here you can take a stroll down the old streets of Central and you will see a dazzling fusion of quirky artistic landmarks. Rows of galleries invite you into different realms where the works of Western and Asian maestros are featured alongside together. The culture hubs also combine traditional craftsmanship with modern aesthetics. Not far from here is the Meho House. The Meho House, while not being ancient in design, it is actually an important relic of the recent past. The Meho House was built by the British after a terrible fire consumed the islands during the 1950s fire. Here, Meho House captures how Hong Kong people actually lived during the 50s, 60s and 70s. Uh, Youth Hostel Association is about uh, seven hostels in total in Hong Kong. Uh, this one is being the, the most, uh, the biggest one and the most uh, prominent one or what we call it is like a, a city hostel. The other uh, six hostels are all spread around uh, Hong Kong um, in Sai Kung area and um, Nong Ping, the, the top big Buddha, near Big Buddha and a different part of, the, of Hong Kong basically. Uh, those ones, what we call is like uh, uh, outdoor, uh, not outdoor, I would say, they, we call them as like uh, outskirt hostels. So that's more ingrained for the nature, nature level sort of uh, uh, guests who would be coming in. So YHA in Hong Kong uh, is uh, seven hostel. This building, Meho House, um, actually is the uh, only Mark I uh, historical building in Hong Kong right now. Uh, the history of this thing is that um, in 1953, December, when there was a major fire in Hong Kong, this whole area was completely gutted, basically. And uh, we had somewhere about 40 to 45,000 people affected of that. And because those people were affected, Hong Kong government or British government at that time had no clue or had no uh, housing policies uh, at that time, government housing policies. So what they did was they quickly, after that fire, they quickly came up with this housing policy and these were the, these, this building was part of that housing block, the first housing block, uh, government housing block that we did is part of that. So now until 1960s or until 1980s, this thing was still the same housing block. But after that, it started changing uh, basically. And then, um, you know, uh, the other buildings around sort of got demolished, rebuilt, much more better uh, environment started coming in. Uh, and then this building was left empty at that time. So only in, in, in late, um, or actually in, in early 2000s, the government decided to sort of do something about it. And then they designated this building as a heritage building. And then YHA came into, or they were selected uh, at, in 2006, I would say, yeah, 2006, to, to be part of uh, like a cultural heritage program building up sort of a thing. So we, they decided to convert this building into a hostel rather than being a hotel hotel, so into a hostel. So the renovation started in 2006, 2007, and it took quite a long time to come up to this kind of uh, not the structure, the structure is still the same old, but expansion of the rooms that we have now. Um, earlier it was very small, but now it's a little bit bigger rooms and individual bathrooms in every room. Earlier this part or the central block that we call it uh, had like a common bathroom and uh, it was a really bad situation. Uh, so in 2006 the renovation started and then YHA sort of uh, took or was selected to to, to run the hostel in, and then we open in 2013. Today, the YHA Meho House Youth Hostel houses thousands of tourists every year and it also showcases an ability for how youth hostels can be used as an occupation where you can actually preserve the past while being commercially vibrant and commercially viable. 
we have varied guests. Uh, we have uh, literally guests coming in from all over the, the world, basically. Uh, highest number currently now being from China, of course. Um, we, I would say, we go somewhere about eight to 9,000 guests uh, in a year. Uh, and that's significant uh, for, for a hostel of this size. Uh, you know, having that kind of a guest is quite significant. Uh, but our major, major, major clientele are actually from um, China, uh, Taiwan, uh, Japan, South Korea. These, these are our major, major clientele coming in from there. We do have people coming in from Europe as well. The Meho House Museum showcases Shaq Kip May's public housing history through the 50s to 70s and it's a mixture of donated exhibits and first-hand anecdotes that was left behind by former residents. From the building point, um, of course, we, we have our museum, Heritage Museum right there. So we do have, um, you know, we do encourage them to visit the museum. Um, we do have uh, a small, like a, uh, a, a mini store, basically. We, we, we sell nostalgic items over there. You know, there's nothing new or quirky things. So it, if you are happen to sort of go into there, you will see uh, all those small items which were quite prominent in 1950s till 1980s are there and then people can actually take them, buy them and then, you know, keep that part of that. So that part of the culture, the part of history, you can still see it in this place. This place you can see it, of course, in, into the, the museum and the guest rooms. Uh, if you go to the guest rooms, you do have uh, uh, you know, uh, photo frames of people, those who used to live here. Uh, we do have photos in our guest rooms who, who actually contributed themselves. We, we asked at that time, uh, do you have any memories or recollections and things like that? And these guys were generally happy to give their photos, uh, some small artifacts which we put it in our museums to, to share with the, the other community over here. So that's, uh, that's the history of this building basically. You know, it's like, 70, 80 years of history is like consolidated into that one small uh, heritage museum basically over there. Yeah. People, have, um, people are now more open to, to understand the history, right? Um, frankly speaking myself, I, I had no clue before joining this place that there was a building like this. I was, every time there was a mindset that, oh, it's a big commercial place, Hong Kong, you know, tall high rises. When I, but when I first came here and I was like, hmm, okay, this is something different. And first thing that came into my mind was, oh, this is very old building, you know, so how is it being maintained and things like that. But once you get involved in that, that's where you, you realize that it's, it's different. Now, not only myself, but there were so many other people that I knew of who had no clue. So well, when I'm talking about that, these guys are saying, oh yeah, I will come and see. So now that, I mean, I see it's not only within my group of friends, but other people, those who are coming in, they're actually trying to uh, preserve the history, but all at the same time, trying to learn the culture of Hong Kong, or old Hong Kong, I would say. You know, maintaining this building is very difficult, very tough task, because um, some like all of a sudden the paintwork is gone. So it's like, okay, how do I do that? You can't change, oh, I just want to do paint. No, you have to go for that specific paint that was originally, you know, done on this building. Yeah. So it's like outside you will see this in an orange color. So that's an original paint. So now, so if we had to do some repaint, we actually have to find the same, you know, thing to bring it back and do it. So those kind of things are is the one that really affects um, the the upkeep of it. Uh, of course, it brings the cost and everything. But you know, that is keeping the history alive through the, I would say, latest innovations and technologies basically that we have. We'll take a short break where we will come back and visit the Murakami versus Murakami art exhibition. Continuing our journey of exploring the artistic side of Hong Kong, we went to Tycoon. 
Tycoon is the center for heritage and arts, a place for inspiration, a place for stimulation, and a place for enjoyment for all Hong Kong people and tourists alike. Tycoon aspires to offer the best heritage and arts experiences and to cultivate knowledge and appreciation of the contemporary art. Currently here on exhibition is the exhibition of the Japanese artist Takashi Murakami. Takashi Murakami is a Japanese contemporary artist who is famous for the super flat movement. We speak with the art director about the Murakami vs Murakami exhibition. Hello, my name is Tobias Berger. I'm head of art here at Daigun Contemporary but I'm also the curator of this exhibition, which is called Murakami vs. Murakami, and is up here at Daigun until the 1st of September this year. Um, I think this is one of the most important exhibitions in Asia at the moment. It's a solo exhibition by and Takashi Murakami, who is one of the most important artists in the world at the moment. It's an exhibition tailor-made here for Daigun, where Takashi Murakami brings together some older works, but also some brand new works in very, very um, immersive environments um, that are seven different rooms. And they start from very dark, apocalyptic feeling rooms, and but go also to very happy rooms, to golden rooms. So the whole idea and the whole character of Takashi Murakami is on view at Daigun at the moment. People think about Takashi Murakami, they only think about the flowers or the cooperations he did with Louis Vuitton. However, as we see here in the background with the bacon pictures, but also in many other works, you see that he's a much deeper, much more considered artist that really takes, um, takes ideas and histories from all, all over the place, especially um, Japanese mythology, um, to produce his amazing artworks. The idea of Takashi versus Takashi Murakami, it is to show his thought process, to show the different faces of Takashi Murakami and really to, to almost draw up the way he produces artworks, the way of his thinking and the way of his different characters he is. On the one side, he is an amazing artist, but he's also a collector. He also has a commercial animation studio. Um, so there are a lot of different parts of Takashi Murakami and that's why we have the title, Murakami versus Murakami, but that's also why every of the seven rooms has its own um, topic. Or, yeah. And this, while concludes the journey of Hong Kong, will never actually conclude the exploration of this beautiful island. We've been here for just a short time, uh, but we've always thought about Hong Kong as a place of business and a place of transaction. We never really did think about Hong Kong as a place for tourists and destinational visits. That's why I hope with this particular view, we have brought another aspect or another side of Hong Kong that you can actually enjoy. That's it from me for this uh, series of a short tour to Hong Kong. I hope you do enjoy uh, this show. Remember, if you want to watch more about Hong Kong, just head on to the Hong Kong Tourism Board website. There's plenty of things that you can learn from Hong Kong from that site. Also, you can look at all the other episodes that we're on offering right now on Astro One, particularly on the travel show Arrivals. This has been a fantastic journey for me and I hope it has been an interesting journey for you as well. Until next time, this is me signing off from Hong Kong. Oh, and by the way, it's bloody uh, hot right now, so I'm sweating my ass off. Um, and I just want to make sure that uh, this one goes in the outtake. Until next time, goodbye.